One idea that should make intuitive sense is that the intensity of a signal is proportional to the number of equivalent nuclei that resonate at that frequency, right? The more nuclei we have in the sample that resonate at that frequency, the higher the peak. The height of the peak can be deceptive though because how broad the peak is affects its height and peak broadening can happen due to structural factors. And so rather than looking just at the peak height, we look at the area under the peak or the integration to determine the number of hydrogens associated with the signal. Integration is defined as the area under a peak and you see it typically in NMR spectra as an S-shaped curve above or sort of coincident with each peak. What that curve is showing you is how the area under the curve changes as we move along from left to right through the signal. So for example, this signal here, we would see an S-shaped curve with some bumps each time we hit a sub-peak. There are four bumps because there are four sub-peaks within this signal. The bumps don't matter so much. It's the height of this S-shaped curve that tells us the integration. If we did the same thing here, we would observe something like this with three bumps due to the fact that there are three sub-peaks within this signal and a height that's slightly larger than the height over here for reasons we'll see in a second. Finally, for this peak in the middle, notice that it's relatively broad, so it's relatively low. However, the integration here would appear something like this. The computer that processes the NMR spectra will automatically calculate the heights of these S-shaped curves. And when it does for this particular example, we would come up with 1.0 here, 2.0 here, and 3.0 here. And these numbers correspond to the number of hydrogens that give that signal in the sample. The spectrum here is for the molecule ethanol. Ethanol has three distinct types of protons, the methyl group, the methylene, or CH2, and the hydroxyl proton. Based on the numbers of equivalent protons in this molecule, you can probably guess which set of protons goes with which signal. This signal with integration 3 corresponds to the methyl protons, group A. The signal with integration 2 corresponds to the methylene protons, group B. And the broad signal with integration 1 corresponds to the hydroxyl proton, group C. In terms of structure determination, the beauty of integration is that it helps us correlate or assign signals to particular groups of hydrogens. In this particular example, the different sets of hydrogens have different numbers, right? Set A has three, set B has two, and set C has one. So from the integrations alone, we can connect the hydrogens in the structure to the peaks within the spectrum. In general, though, you'll need to use chemical shift and information about coupling to make these assignments rigorously. And integration can be a little bit tricky because protons that are connected to completely different carbons that are related to one another by symmetry that, put another way, share a homotopic or enantiotopic relationship have the same chemical shift. And so we may need to scale the numbers of protons implied by the integration in order to reflect the overall molecular mass of the molecule, which we would need to get from another type of experiment, such as mass spectrometry. Let me show you what I mean by this. The point really here is that integration only tells us the relative numbers of different types of protons. To get absolute numbers of protons, we need information about molecular mass. Here's a very simple NMR spectrum. And if you were to tell the computer that worked up this spectrum to calculate the integration for the single peak here, it would give something like this. And because this is the only peak in the spectrum, it's going to assign an integration value to this of 1.0. It doesn't know what else to do, right? This is the smallest integration, and so by convention, it's going to assign it 1.0. But how many protons are in the actual molecule? Well, one seems odd unless it's something like, you know, HCl or HF, which would appear far more downfield than this peak near zero, and so those are unreasonable. So there's probably not one proton in each molecule of whatever sample we're looking at. In fact, this is an, a proton in a Mars spectrum for methane, which has four equivalent hydrogens. And so although the integration says one, we need information about the molecular mass here. Here it would be about 16 grams per mole in order to scale this appropriately to give the total number of actual protons per molecule, which is four. So we sometimes need information about molecular mass to deal with symmetry issues. Here, all of the hydrogens are homotopic. 
Here's another example with peaks that look similar qualitatively to the ethanol peaks that we saw on the last slide. In this particular case, we would observe an integration of 3.0 for this peak around 1 and an integration of 2.0 for this peak around 3.5. This suggests some kind of formula like CH2, CH3, but in fact this is actually a spectrum for diethyl ether which has that CH2, CH3 fragment twice. And those two fragments, which I'm circling here in blue, are homotopic since we can simply rotate the molecule around like this and exchange those fragments. And so here again, we need information about the molecular mass or molar mass or molecular weight in order to scale these appropriately, multiplying each by two to get to the actual number of hydrogens of that type in the molecule, which in this case is six methyl hydrogens and four methylene hydrogens, organized in two groups that are related by symmetry.